Mitchell. Colin, you are on. Thank you, Ralph. Great to be here, and for the second year now, to visit your class. What I find so refreshing about you and your class is the questions. As Ralph just said, the questions are phenomenal. Many of the questions related to where I come from and how I have come to today be in a position to be the president of a development company that created in partnership with TIFF the Bell Lightbox building or a company that today is now 10 years, almost 11 years into the revitalization of the Region Park community. So how did this happen? What is the arc or the trajectory of my career? Several of the questions were about that. So I want to go back to a long time ago before probably most of you were born. The 1970s, believe it or not, was when I graduated from LSE with a degree in psychology, a master's degree in psychology. That was after a bachelor's degree in psychology from McGill. I came back from London to Montreal and I was looking for a job. Little did I know that the job that I found by opening up the newspaper, the Montreal Gazette, little did I know that the job I found would actually lead to a lifelong career. But my very first job was for the YMCA. So I worked for the YMCA as a community development manager in a very low income community in Montreal. My job was to do health programming, recreational programming with young people, seniors programming. But what happened one day and what really changed the, the, my future in terms of what I was going to do, what happened is that the tenants in this very low income community were all living on month to month leases. At any time, the landlord would be able to give them 30 days and they would have to vacate their homes. That is a very challenging position for any family to be in. Particularly in Montreal at that moment in time, 1973, the vacancy rate was less than 1%. So it wasn't simply that they could pick up their, their bags and their, and their stuff and go down the street to another apartment. There were no other apartments, particularly no affordable apartments for them to go to. So one day, I knew that they were living on month-to-month -month leases, but one day they all come into my office. My office was a burnt-out apartment within this very low-income community that we basically retrofitted as best we can to put in a, a office, a, a desk and a chair. They came running in with their eviction notices saying, what do we do? We have 30 days to get out. What do we do? Mitchell, help. And that was a moment in my life that I will never forget. It's a moment that made me realize how vulnerable people can be, particularly around home, around a place to live, to have their family be safe and secure and not worried about being kicked out on 30 days notice. That moment also taught me that, and you know, people always say you can't fight City Hall, but here's the lesson you in some circumstances have to fight City Hall and in many circumstances if you organize and if you're thoughtful and if you put your arguments together you can actually beat City Hall. Okay. Um, the article, The Marginalization of Tenant Resistance to Mixed Income Social Housing by August suggested five connected dynamics which have been observed in public housing communities. In this context, tenants who are in dire need of better housing and the most efficient me means of delivering better housing are mixed income solutions. In the case of the revitalization of Regent Park, which you were just speaking of, resistance from tenants was limited by factors including a successful campaign by TCHC to brand the project as tenant-oriented, efforts to li limit the public airing of concerns in the public, fear of powerlessness amongst the tenants, and the cooperation of critical voices. August states that in the Regent Park, cooperation occurred when outspoken tenant leaders were hired for either the TCHC or the Daniels Corp, creating a conflicting interest for the newly appointed low-income residents along with fewer voices to lead the tenant movement. Given this is a CSR ethics course, I was hoping you could comment on these allegations. Uh, and aside from this instance, has the Daniels Corp witnessed pushback from the community? And if so, what measures were taken? The idea of a residence movement or that we somehow forestalled or foreclosed the opportunity of residents to organize, 
I think really takes away a lot of credit from the residents themselves and their ability to have a voice. These are residents with a significant voice and we heard it and we hear it. We had a public meeting, a, a public a information meeting, resident for information update a week ago and we continually hear the residents' voices. I think what she's saying is that in her view we should have done nothing, that there shouldn't have been a revitalization, that there shouldn't have been a creation of a mixed income community, that perhaps the building should have been restored as opposed to torn down and rebuilt. And I just think that that idea is just so far off base or so far divorced from the reality. The buildings were beyond repair. The buildings absolutely needed to be torn down. So people would need to be moved. Should we create a community that once again is 100% rent geared to income? I don't think so. I think we should create a community like every community in Toronto, which is mixed income. The Regent Park uh, Public Housing Project is transformed from a low income enclave into a mixed income neighborhood. High praise from a city councillor and mayor known for his activism across the city. This being such a large initiative that has had government pushback to now being known as one of the most successful housing initiatives in the city's history leads me to my question, how are you able to get the support of all three tiers of government to buy in and support such an ambitious project? How did we do it? I mean, it has been hugely challenging, as I've mentioned. We're going to be creating market housing. Can we create market housing that is actually going to be affordable for tenants in Regent Park? Now our company had created an affordable ownership program years before that, uh, probably 2004, 2005. We created an affordable home ownership program and we took that to Regent Park and we went to the province of Ontario and said, you have a role to play. So one role you're playing is to pay for the cost of the contamination and the cleanup. Fabulous. But another role you can play is to put money into creating opportunities for tenants in Regent Park to become homeowners. Because what we need to do, again, is create opportunities for tenants in this neighborhood to grow, to build equity, in fact. So we created two programs with the support of the province of Ontario. One is called the Boost Program, and that's a down payment assistance program where a purchaser can have 10% of the down payment loaned to them, registered as a second mortgage. The program that really impacts people from Regent Park, the, the tenants in Regent Park, is called the Foundation Program. Foundation Program is a phenomenal program where a second mortgage is lent to a tenant living in Regent Park of 35% of the purchase price, registered as a second mortgage, interest-free. Now, why is this program so cool? This program is so cool because now you have a tenant living in social housing who becomes a homeowner by virtue of this loan, down payment assistance that is provided. When that tenant now builds equity in the home because they've been paying the first mortgage, 65% first mortgage, 35% second mortgage, interest free. When they sell their home, 65% of the appreciation goes to the tenant. 35% is channeled back into that down payment assistance pool. It's a revolving fund. We then recycle it back to the next family to become a homeowner. So it is a program where it's not a grant, it's a loan. The loan gets repaid into the fund and it gets repaid with appreciation. So our revolving fund is growing. More people are now taking advantage of that fund as it grows. More TCH tenants become homeowners. Now what's the impact of that? It is enormous. A tenant becomes a homeowner. A tenant now lives in a condominium building. A tenant is now earning equity by virtue of paying their mortgage. And guess what else? They've left social housing, freed up a unit that was built 30 years ago or 40 years ago or 50 years ago that can't be replaced today for anywhere near what the cost was back then. And someone from the social housing waiting list can move into that unit. So it's a win-win. It's a win for everybody if tenants can become homeowners. In a Globe and Mail article, you argue for the need for a national housing strategy that addresses the challenge of homelessness. Homelessness. 
A 2013 survey found an estimated 5,253 homeless people sleeping outside or in shelters, and that the percentage of those over the age of 51 had doubled over the past four years to 29%. Further, with the average private market rent of a bachelor flat at $937 and a maximum Ontario monthly shelter individual allowance of $376, there is a disconnect between social assistance rates and Toronto rents. What are you and the Daniels Corporation doing to directly combat these numbers and the broader issue of homelessness in Toronto? Homelessness is probably the most significant challenge that we face in terms of the the spectrum of housing. So let's start in the big picture and come down to what we're doing and what we're thinking about today. In, in the big picture, our country, Canada, is very close now to having a national housing policy again. As I mentioned, there has not been one since 1984. But the government that has been in place now for 12 months is well along on the road, has just been through months of consultation, and there's been enormous thought and input from all kinds of stakeholders in terms of what a national housing program should look like. And one of the very important building blocks of that new program, that new strategy on a national level will be to address homelessness. We can create the bricks and mortar, but we can't create those support services that will ensure success for that homeless man, woman, or young person. I hope I'm wrong. I hope they do this. But the national program ain't getting me 500 million for Toronto, so uh, uh, I don't think. Do you think it's going to come? 500 mil? Yes. I think it's a matter of priority. And I hope you're right. And I hope I'm wrong. I would be honored to say I'm wrong. We need to realign. We need to realign our priorities. Where is the number one priority? Where do we start? Food and shelter, to me, is where we start. We start with a person's basic right in a country as affluent as ours to have food on the table and a safe place to live. That to me is the starting point. With urban population soaring day by day, there is an immediate need for sustainable performance of the buildings. Per the year 2014, Toronto has observed growth rate of 5.9% in urban population. Could you provide insights on the latest real estate sustainable practices in GTA and how companies such as Daniels Corporation are looking to tackle the growth in real estate market in a sustainable way? So as a company, we have always thought about how do we build a better home that is more energy efficient. We did that in 1984. The very first community that we did was built to an energy performance standard at that point in time that was the ultimate energy performance standard called R2000. We built the first communities in the country to the R2000 standard because we believed that the homes that were being built under the standard building code were not good enough. So we've continued to build homes that are way above building code from an energy performance point of view. So a Forbes study recently showed that 45% of millennials plan to stay with their current company for less than two years. Uh, and it has become common knowledge that our gen generation will job hop more than our parents. Uh, so as someone who has stayed with the same organization since 1984, what do you believe companies can do to retain employees in the long term? Is this even a problem from an organizational perspective? That is to say, job hopping. 100% it's a problem, in my view. Having a team of people that grow with you and stay with you and understand the values that you want to develop as a company, to me that's the number one thing. So building a team that is stable, that want to be with us, that we nurture, that we create opportunities within the company for growth, is probably one of the things that we do best. So I've been, as I mentioned, since 1984 partners with Jack. My partners who have come in since have been there since 1987, 88, 89. So our senior management team have all been with us for well over 20 years. And they're there because they believe as I believe in what we're doing. We look at our business as more than just a business and maybe that's part of it. We look at our business as a platform for progressive social change. And Ralph may think that's weird, but that's okay. That's how we look at our business. 
We're successful in business and that gives us an opportunity that allows us to push the barriers, that allows us to push the boundaries, to think about can we create transitional housing? I can guarantee that no other company in our sector is thinking about that today. We're thinking about it because we care about the communities we, that we work in and we have the ability to do it. We have the technical know-how and we have the people that feel empowered to do it and in feeling empowered to do it, they ain't going anywhere. On behalf of Ryerson, I want to thank you. Is it five o'clock? And Mitch is going to stick around, uh, <laughs> have some wine and cheese. Thanks, everybody.